In the late 70s, when the white lady, or Virgin Mary, cocaine emerged, young people became monsters as they move away from sunshine pills and marijuana and crave the white stuff. As the levels of frustration increased among the young urban poor, the youth became more dependent on drugs, as for them it eased their pain and made them more fearless and forceful in their activities. Subsequent to this time, the one-pop guns made from bicycle bars and street signs disappeared and manufactured weapons appeared. It was within this same era that community programs were referred to as communist, and many of the inner city youth withdrew from a large number of community training programs that provided opportunities for leadership development and economic growth through small business development. A number of community initiatives were undertaken by the then government in an attempt to alleviate some of the suffering and hardships experienced by the urban poor. Many food programs were instituted but were not well received by partisan community dwellers. The communist propaganda of the period created even further division among the urban and rural poor to the extent that even the chronic poor refused assistance if that assistance was not directly handed down from the party they supported. This propaganda had such a tremendous and deep-rooted effect that the psyche of the communities was the vegetable patties provided under the school feeding program were said to contain communist powder, which if the children ate it, would control their minds and the boys would be sent to, on ships to Cuba to be grown. Some parents believe this and consequently, this type of propaganda helped destroy the concept of community. And at the time, continued to put community workers' lives at risk. Those persons who were willing to lend a hand and to traverse the communities to assist the poor were viewed as communist supporters. Many workers were threatened and even beaten and chased from sections of communities. At the national level, political violence and criminality escalated dramatically. Table one provides an overview of the nature and level of crime and violence that took place in Jamaica between 1976 and 1981. The level of political violence escalated dramatically in the 1976 election campaign in which 162 persons were killed. This political disorder and rising crime caused the government to declare a state of emergency which remained in effect until June 1977. By 1979 to 80, the level of violence escalated, leaving 943 persons dead, including a member of parliament. This continued political polarization in the society as well as the ineffective responses to the needs of the inner city communities has contributed to the community members and communities establishing their own system of justice through kangaroo courts or foul court justice as they were called, where punishment for crime is related to the severity of the crime. Foul court justice was a term used by communities in Grand Spain at the time. That is what they would call their justice. It's actually a court where if you commit a crime, you would be brought to that court and you would be judged by your peers and the punishment will be issued. Be it water and crackers for the day, but you will be punished. This system led to an increase in retaliatory violent behavior thus silencing communities and creating mistrust among residents who became unsure of who to trust because they feared being labeled informers. First rule in silencing the community and Jamaica. This dynamic system of relative community justice also hampered production within the local business sector. 
those who sought to carry out sanctions, took over communities and were feared. They began to establish their own economic base through extortion and briberies, for example, robbery and stealing. As this system spread, established governance structures fell apart and new leadership emerged when there were income generating activities to be implemented. Importantly, these new and deviant economic opportunities were primarily beneficial to the dominant males within the community. Consequently, the community suffered from a sense of alienation, hopelessness, aimlessness, frustration, and aggressive behavior among its members. With the eruption of violence in the 1970s, the communities became closed. The use of infrastructure has therefore changed, and the roads have become common spaces in which all communities, community activities take place. Basketball, football, cricket. If you pass through any inner city community, you will see that. In instances where social spaces exist, they are not used because it leaves the youth open to attack by rival factions, resulting in these spaces being abandoned and ultimately neglected because of fear. No, it does not matter. When, when a young man is afraid, when you put him in a building and he's, it is closed off, he cannot see what is happening outside. And therefore, it is very difficult to go into a classroom, to go into anywhere at all, to have a meeting. He's not sure what his role is. He's not sure what, what your goals are. He's not sure. He has learned that he can die. The housing stock within these communities is comprised of dilapidated buildings, informal settlements, and overcrowded yards. This results in high levels of interpersonal conflict, which sometimes escalate to include entire families and the wider community, and sometimes lead to the continuous upsurge of violence. You can't, I am in my yard, you can't play a sound system, I don't want the music today. So there's always that back and forth in. As a result, persons from form little attachment to their living spaces, even today have no vision or goal for the community in which they live, and therefore aspire to migrate to greener pastures, be those pastures, uptown, other parishes, or overseas. Additionally, high levels of frustration, little or no opportunity, and increasing desperation continue to foster this desire in many individuals to migrate to foreign, at any cost or relocate uptown. The move uptown became a reality through the capturing of vacant lots in residential areas as community residents perceive those areas to be more conducive to improvements in their lifestyles. Additionally, some women with foreign-minded aspirations began generating income by becoming drug mules. And we know of the stories. Today we have hibiscus trying to solve some of those problems. While some men armed themselves with icy mint, sweets, crackers, and water in order to store away in the body of freight liners that docked at the Kingston Harbor. And I tell you a little story, a young man went into one of those and he said he went down in the engine room with his crackers and water and he thought the ship was going to, the freight was going to New Orleans. However, when it stopped at a port, he came off and he said it took him 10 days walking through forest. He didn't find his way. And he saw a man who didn't speak any English, but somebody interpreted and said, no, you're in Honduras. He was totally disoriented. He was deported back to Jamaica and remained in the central lockups for a good time. He's, he's now dead. But he went into the hospital and he spent six months suffering from dehydration. The push was so great at this time. Every day at Grace and Staff, people come for crackers, water, ice cream, because they need to get out of this country. This led to women and men becoming illegal residents in foreign countries as they would run off after completing their task. 
while others would use the proceeds of their activities to, par to purchase houses outside of their community or uptown. Those who chose to remain in the community sought to create viable social and economic options through buying and selling both legal and illegal goods and preying on the most vulnerable of persons while using fraudulent documents to solicit help from business places for non-existent sporting activities, supposedly for the young, and to help the elderly. <laughs> 